Well, I invite you to open a Bible to Psalm 23. Over the coming weeks, we're going to uh, be reading Psalm 23 quite often. Hopefully, by the end of it, you will have it memorized, and it will be deep in your heart and soul as a reminder of God's goodness and love for you. And as you're turning to Psalm 23, I want to start with a story that Oz Guinness, who's a very famous missiologist and author and theologian, tells um, of a man named Petrov who was working in a factory kind of work camp situation in Soviet Union under the rule and reign of Khrushchev. And during this time, factory workers were known to take items home from work in order to make ends meet. And so eventually... Eventually, what happened, they would have to go through this inspection with the guards to make sure that they weren't stealing anything and taking anything home. And so the story goes about Petrov is that each and every day he would fill up a wheelbarrow with two bags of sawdust. And he would take it to the gate and he would take it to the inspection and the soldiers and the guards would look at it and find out that it was nothing but sawdust, which they didn't care about. So they would let him go. And each and every day this went on, and as Guinness tells the story that it goes on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And eventually one of the guards who is rotating out and is near the end of his time at that factory eventually asks Petrov one night, I promise you won't get in trouble. Which if you've grown up any time, like you know when someone tells you, I promise you won't get in trouble, you're going to get in trouble, right? But he tells Petrov, I promise you won't get in trouble. I won't report you at all. I know you're stealing something from us because you're taking these bags out every single night. I just can't figure out what it is. I just want to know, what are you stealing? And Petrov looked at the guard and said, I'm stealing wheelbarrows. Right? And it was the most obvious thing. He wasn't stealing sawdust. He was stealing the wheelbarrows that he was using to roll out the sawdust bags every single night. Now, the point of this story that Oz Guinness uh, tells and shares with us is that sometimes as human beings, we miss the most obvious thing that's right in front of us, right? We're, We're looking at all the details. We're looking at other things. We get distracted and we miss the fact that that Petrov was stealing wheelbarrows. And the same thing happens with our faith, right? When we get asked questions like, what is Christianity about? What is church about? What is your faith thing about? There's a lot of options that we could answer with. There's a lot of things that we could tell people. And a lot of people also assume certain answers to it. Right? We, we assume answers of it's, it's got to be about a certain behavior, a certain way to worship, a certain way to look, a certain way to act, right? And so these are the things that we get distracted with. We, we start focusing on those, like improving ourselves, doing better, all of these things. And so what we end up answering that question with is telling other people it's about all this other stuff. It's about the sawdust, <laughs> And the reality is it's about the wheelbarrows. It's, it's about Jesus. Now, when we show up to church, that sounds really obvious, right? You're like, yeah, of course this is all about Jesus. Let me ask you a personal question. How many of you have come to church and had a Sunday morning where it wasn't about Jesus in your mind or your heart? Anybody? No one wants to admit it? Okay, well, I have, even as a preacher. I've been like, well. Anybody ever been a little distracted or unfocused? You're worried or stressed about something, you bring it with you. Or maybe on your way here, there's a fight or a disagreement or an argument. And so the whole time you're just sitting in the pew wondering how you're going to win the conversation after this pause for church. I'm sure none of you have ever done that with all the people you love, right? So here's the deal. It sounds like it's really obvious what, what is your faith about? What is Christianity about? What is, what is all this church stuff about? And a lot of times, though, we, we give the wrong answer. We should say it's about Jesus. But a lot of times we, we tend to get sidetracked with all the details and everything else that comes along with it, right? Certain ways to live and, and behavior and all of these morals and all that stuff. And we forget to tell people, well, the answer is Jesus. 
And in fact, this is so important that in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus even asked the disciples the question, who do people say that I am? And they give a bunch of answers, meaning they're interested in Jesus, but they haven't what? Figured it out yet. And so they give all kinds of good answers, just like people do today. What is Christianity about? What is Jesus about? And there's all kinds of suggested answers. It's helping people, it's caring for people, awesome ethics, some good morals, maybe some other not so great answers. And then Jesus looks at the disciples, he looks at the church and he goes, but who do you say that I am? Right? And so he flips and says, no, it's not just a question for people out there, it's a question for people in here. Who do we say that Jesus is? And of course, Peter gives a magnificent answer. It says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And then immediately, you know what Peter does? He gets it wrong. <laughs> He's like, you are the Messiah, you are the Son of God. And, and Peter is told by Jesus, great job, Peter, you got it right. Just like if I asked you right now, because we're here on a Sunday morning, it's the right answer. What is our faith? What is Christianity? What's it all about? How many of you would just say, Pastor, it's about Jesus? Because it's the right answer. Now, how many of you, and I'm guilty too, are just like Peter, that as soon as Jesus goes, great job, Peter, and then tells Peter and the disciples, I'm gonna to go to the cross and die. Peter says, not on my watch. I'm not gonna let it happen. So what does Peter do? He gets it wrong. He gets sidetracked. He's like, yeah, okay, it's, about, but it's not about that, Jesus. It's about, for Peter, it was, you're gonna set up a, a political kingdom. You're gonna make some changes in the world. So we're a lot like Peter. We get it right sometimes. Oh, it's, it's about Jesus. Make it about behavior. We make it about worship. We make it about a checklist of doing the right thing. We make it about all kinds of other stuff. Sometimes we're really sinful. We make it about judging others for not behaving the right way. And all of a sudden, we've forgotten the fact that it's about Jesus, and not just Jesus, but the Jesus who went to the cross to do what? Forgive people to save them, to redeem them. So what I want to do over the coming weeks is I want to look at Psalm 23 to help us answer that question. Who do we say Jesus is? Who do you say that he is? To help us have a good answer that when, when the world asks us, what's your faith about? What, what is your belief about? Why do you go to church? Why do you worship? That you would have a better answer than, I've always done it. <laughs> it's just the right thing to do. And we'll be able to say, no, it's because of who Jesus is. And when they ask, well, who's Jesus? You and I have an answer. The reason I'm using Psalm 23 is because I'm assuming you're kind of familiar with it, right? So it's a good stepping stone. I'm not asking you to memorize Leviticus, okay? It's Psalm 23. And guess what we're going to read over the coming weeks every Sunday? Psalm 23. So maybe you'll memorize it. You'll get it in your heart, and it'll be a reminder of, oh, this is who Jesus is. And this is the Jesus I can tell people about. So we're going to look at the first two verses this morning. Psalm 23 begins, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Now, as I was practicing this sermon, it was really hard to stop at verse two because I have it memorized. I'm just used to like, you just say the whole thing all at once, right? But as we look at just these couple of verses, there's two incredibly important things for us to hold on to that what we need to know about who Jesus is and that we can share with the world of who Jesus is. The first is it says, the Lord is my shepherd. And the, the whole picture throughout scripture of shepherds is that they love their sheep. The whole picture of shepherds throughout scripture is that they will do anything to give their sheep life. When I was growing up, my home church, when, um, we had a courtyard and there was a statue in that courtyard of Jesus with a shepherd's staff and a baby sheep, a lamb, laying over his shoulders. And everybody in the church loved that statue so much that when we moved campuses across the whole city, 
we took the statue with us and we put it in a new courtyard because it was this beautiful reminder of that's who Jesus is. Now, for those of you who, who might be familiar with Jesus and you've grown up with the church and you've heard Psalm 23 before, you'd be like, of course he's a shepherd. How many of you are blown away and that's a new detail for you? All right? Here's the deal, though. For a lot of people in the world who Jesus calls his lost sheep, they don't know him as a good shepherd. A lot of people have a view of Jesus, a view of God, that they don't measure up. That God is actually against them, judging them, condemning them. And the first line of Psalm 23 is this beautiful, simple reminder. Well, my God is a shepherd. Jesus is a shepherd, and we see throughout Scripture that the shepherd loves his sheep. He cares for his sheep. He does anything to give them life. And in fact, the way that Jesus views the world is there are sheep who are found and there are sheep who are lost. If you read the Gospels carefully, he doesn't say there are sheep and then non-sheep. You ever catch that detail? Jesus looks at the whole world and says, there are sheep who have been found, who have been rescued and redeemed and forgiven and brought into the family. And then there are sheep over here who are still my sheep. I still love them. I still care for them. They're just a little lost. And so the good news of who Jesus is, is that he's a shepherd who loves his sheep. He loves the sheep who are found. He loves you greatly so much that he has given his life for you to forgive you and redeem you and save you and make you belong to his flock. And the, also the good news though for the world is, it's not that you're not a sheep, it's just that you're a lost sheep, but Jesus is a shepherd who loves you and wants to welcome you home. In fact, in John chapter 10, you get the very famous statement from Jesus where he says, I am the good shepherd. Not the tyrannical shepherd, not the judgmental beat you up with a stick shepherd, right? Not the destroy you shepherd, but the what kind of shepherd is Jesus? The good shepherd. So what does he mean by that? He means he's a perfect shepherd who's always watching. Over his sheep, always offering the same relationship to the rest of the world. So if you and I ever have an opportunity to share the faith, to be asked the question, what, what is it about? The simple answer to give is it's about Jesus. Well, who, who's Jesus, right? Just the same question that Jesus asked the disciple. Who, who is he? Who do you say he is? Just start with Psalm 23 and say, well, he, he's a good shepherd. He loves his sheep. You're one of them even if you don't know it. <laughs> You're one of them even if you feel a little lost and don't know that he loves you. The good news is that he's a good shepherd who loves all his sheep, the lost ones and the found ones. And then it goes on. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. So here's the imagery for a sheep. What do they need to live? Green pastures and water. And so what does the good shepherd do? He comes to do what? He, he gives the sheep life. So he's a good shepherd who gives us the things that we need for life. And I, I love that it says he makes me lie down. <laughs> uh, if you've never paid attention or talked to a farmer before, I've never been a farmer, but I've talked to them. Sheep are not readily obedient like your dog is, right? <laughs> they are stubborn. And if you talk to shepherds and farmers, they're also dumb. So God describing us, don't take too offensively, did not pick the smartest animal in the world and go, yeah, you're like that. He picked a sheep <laughs> who's stubborn and dumb and gets lost on their own without a shepherd. And he goes, that's more of what you're like. You're like, no, I'm a monkey. I'm super smart. He's like, no, 
you're the stubborn, getting lost sheep that doesn't know it's good for you. So what does the good shepherd do? He says, you're going in the wrong direction. You're getting more lost. So I'm going to guide you to the things that you need for life. Like, oh, I'm going to run over here. And I'm going to get this thing. I want this. I want that. I'm going to pursue this. How many of you have ever told yourself, if I just get this, man, life will be great. Anybody lied to yourself where you were like under a tremendous amount of stress and pressure and you're like, if this one little thing just changes, and, you're, and even your imagination, you're just like, oh, it'd be so relaxing. Anybody ever done that? How many of you know it's a lie and you just keep on doing it, right? <laughs> like, why? Because sometimes we're dumb sheep. We are. I love you. But you're a dumb sheep sometimes. I'm a dumb sheep sometimes. Let's just all embrace it. Because the celebration isn't how good of a sheep I am. The celebration is how good is my shepherd. So yeah, I'm a dumb sheep. I get lost and I'm stubborn and I go in the wrong direction all the time. I pursue things that are not good for my soul. I chase after idols and false gods that do not give me life. But the good news is I have a good shepherd who makes me, sometimes against my will, to lie down in green pastures and by still waters and say, this is where you will get life. So in John chapter 10, when Jesus is declared, I'm the good shepherd, he comes along and he says, I have come that they, his sheep, you and me, anybody who has been rescued and redeemed by him, may have life abundantly. Now there's a bajillion English translations of this. Some say may have life abundantly, may have life to the full, right? The idea is that it was, it's an overflowing life. The word he's using there is an exaggerated word. That means to overflow more than you could ever need. So a lot of times as dumb sheep, stubborn sheep, we're chasing after things. We're like, if I could just get this, I'll get a little relief, a little less stress, a little more happiness. I'll, my heart will be content. Just one more thing. And Jesus goes, well, I'm, I'm the good shepherd who's guiding you to the green pastures and the still waters that your soul actually needs. And sometimes it's in a direction we don't want to go. Anybody ever argued with God? I mean, good luck with it. I'm winning. I'm sure we have because we're humans. We're stubborn sheep. We're like, no, I'm going to go this way. And he says, no, I'm going to make you go this way. And one of the lies that the devil wants you and me and the world to believe is that makes Jesus mean. If he's not gonna let me have my way, if he's not gonna let me follow my heart or go with my gut, he must not be a loving God, right? Lots of people think that way and feel that way. But the reason Psalm 23 says, no, I'm, I'm gonna make you go this way. I'm going to make you lay down in these green pastures and still water. It's because God is saying, I'm a good shepherd and knows what you actually need for life. And Jesus says, I'm not doing it to be mean or to pick on you or to not give you a good life. He's saying, no, actually, the whole reason I came is to give you a life that is abundant. It's overflowing. It's more fulfilling than you could ever have on your own. But Satan loves to trick us. Which is why one of the next verses in John chapter 10 that Jesus says is, the thief comes only to destroy and to kill the sheep. The thief being Satan and his temptation to sin and his lies and his deception is, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over here and that'll give me life. That'll fulfill me. That relationship, that job, that promotion, that recognition will be the thing that will give me peace. Had a dream that you actually, show hands, like let's, who's optimistic in this life, all right? You set a goal, you set a dream, you got it. Now, that's wonderful. I am proud of you and your hard work, okay? <laughs> How many of you, after getting that goal, that achievement, that dream, said, I'm good for the rest of my life? Anybody? You know why? Because on the way 
to that dream, that goal achievement, we think to ourselves, that's it, man. If I get that, life will be a dream. It'll be amazing. And then you get there and you go, what? Oh, well, I mean, it's good, but you could use another one, right? So how many of you, after doing that, you set some new goals and dreams and achievements you wanted to chase after? Anybody? All right, don't feel bad. You're a human. It's okay, right? <laughs> but what is that doing? So that is good, but sometimes we can get so off track as stubborn and cheap that we go, I just got to set, if I just get another one, if I just make it to the next one, I'll have life. And it becomes exhausting, it becomes stressful, and it wears us out, and it doesn't actually fulfill us the way we are hoping. And that's how Satan works in our lives. He, he just sees us as the sheep of, I'm going to leave the green pastures behind. We even have a, a phrase in our culture, right? How many of you have heard the idea that grass is always greener? All right. And how many of you have always heard the rebuttal? Well, it's not because you get over there and you realize it's, it's dying too, right? And we all know this, right? Because we want to sound profound and philosophical and wise. Like the grass is, and we even have dumb phrases where we're like, no, the grass is green. It's where you water it, right? And all this back and forth. And you know what we do anyway because we're dumb sheep? We go over to the other side where the grass is greener, right? And they're like, it's not going to be, but I'm going to. The good shepherd says, I'm making you lie down in green pastures. And Satan comes along and is like, you know the grass is greener over there? We're like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. And we chase after it. And what we need is a good shepherd who comes along and says, no, but I came along to give you life. An abundant life, an overflowing life, a life that actually fulfills your heart's desire and your soul. And I'm, if I have to, I'm going to make you lay down here and have this life. So this is who our Jesus is. In Luke 14, in the gospel reading, we see this parable that Jesus tells of a, of a party being thrown. And if you read the parable carefully, he insults everybody there. <laughs> the great story, Jesus. He tells a parable to the host of saying, your guest list is all wrong. Because his guest list included Jesus, who was a rabbi, and other influential people in the community, and higher ups, and wealthy people. And Jesus looks around at all these people and says to the host, you invited the wrong people. Now, because you're a Christian, you're like, oh, Jesus is always right. I know you're thinking that. But if you were in that room at that moment, you'd think, I thought it was a nice party, right? Because it's all the best people, right? It's all the most important people. You're like, this is a great party. I can't believe I made the list and I'm here. What do you mean we invited the wrong people, Jesus? And at the end, Jesus says, now here's who I want you to invite. All of the people that the world said shouldn't make the list. Now, I don't know about you, that's a, quite a challenge for the next party that you throw. But the point that Jesus is making is that that's how he throws parties as the good shepherd. We tend to, as human beings, make a list of say, these are the people worthy enough to be invited into the flock. These are the people worthy enough and good enough and powerful enough and well-behaved enough to be invited to the party that Jesus is throwing. And his whole point with the parable is, I'm actually inviting everybody. I'm inviting all the found sheep that think they are not a dumb sheep, that think they are awesome sheep, the best sheep ever. And he says, I'm also inviting all the lost sheep who've been worn out and beaten up by the world and sometimes by the church. He said, no, I'm inviting everybody. Now here's the really big point of his parable. Jesus says, invite them because they can never repay you. And that's his point. He's saying, this is how I work. I'm inviting all of the sheep to be part of my flock. I'm inviting all of the sheep to come to my party and to my banquet and live with me. 
And his whole point is, none of you can pay me back. I don't care how good of a sheep you think you are. Jesus' whole point is, you're simply here because of the grace of God. You are a sheep that was rescued and found by a savior who chased after you. And he's saying, his grace that was powerful and life-changing and transforming for you is being offered to all of the sheep out there who are wandering around and lost. And what he wants you and I to do as Christians is to let them know who Jesus is, to let them know who the good shepherd is. So we get asked the question, what, what's it all about? What, what, what's what being a Christian all about? The simple answer is it's about Jesus. And who is Jesus? Well, he's a good shepherd who comes to give life to all of his sheep the found ones, and the lost ones. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you found us, that as stubborn, dumb sheep who get lost in our own sin, you forgive us and redeem us and have come to give us life and life eternal. May we remember that the answer to the question of what is it all about is always Jesus. It's always about you. And that we would share with the world the good news that you are a good shepherd who has come to bring life to all of his sheep, even the lost ones. In your name we pray. Amen.